It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Yesterday was an historic victory for Ontario workers. The courts recognized that 800,000 public sector workers and New Democrats have been saying for years that Bill 124 was unconstitutional. That was affirmed by the courts. Bill 124 is unconstitutional. This is a hard-fought and long-overdue victory for workers who deserve a government that will respect this decision and work with them to move forward. Why won't the Premier respect the court ruling and stop appealing yet another court loss for this government? To reply, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think the, the member opposite knows that we're reviewing the, the decision. We intend to appeal, and, and so I can't comment further upon uh, comment there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Supplementary question. Speaker, we have seen the consequences of this government's wage restraint across the public sector, but nowhere have the effects been more acute than in our health care sector, where Bill 124 has directly contributed to our province's current health care crisis. Given yesterday's ruling, will the government finally admit that Bill 124 has had a negative impact on our health care system? Respond, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the Attorney General said, we are reviewing this decision. Our intention is to appeal, but we will speak to our investments uh, in health care, especially in health human resources. Since March of 2020, we have added over 12,000 health care professionals to the system. Just this year alone, the Ontario Colleges of Nurses has registered over 12,800 nurses just this year. And we still have two months to go. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to make these historic investments to support health care uh, workers and the delivery of health care services all across this province. Final supplementary, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the Ontario Superior Court Justice threw up Bill 124 in its entirety, ruling it absolutely null and void. Justice Conan found that Ontario was not facing an economic situation that, in quotes, justified an infringement of charter rights, that the law was substantially interference on the constitutionally protected bargaining rights of hundreds of thousands of workers. Speaker, Bill 124 has been bad for workers in Ontario, period, and should never have seen the light of day in the first place. Speaker, it's long past time the government started showing workers the respect they deserve from day one. With the cost of living skyrocketing, Speaker, my question is, will the government get out of its own way, get out of the way workers' protected right to freely bargain a fair wage, and finally respect this decision? Immigration training and skills development. Speaker, uh, we're continuing working for workers every single day uh, in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That's why uh, we partnered with uh, private sector unions. Uh, employers uh, and tradespeople to bring in the building opportunities in the Skilled Trades Act to get tens of thousands of people into well-paying jobs in the province. Mr. Speaker, that's why we brought in historic legislation in Working for Workers 1 in Working for Workers 2 uh, to ensure that workers have the right to disconnect, that for the first time in Canadian history, we're recognizing international credentials so when newcomers come to this province, they can work in professions that they've studied. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, we became the first in Canada to give truck drivers access to washroom facilities across this province. And Mr. Speaker, we are the first in North America to move forward with expanding Spons. portable benefits so millions of workers that don't have health and dental benefits today are going to get those benefits under Premier Ford. Here, here. Question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, again to the Premier. Today's Auditor General report showed a real state of affairs, a sad state of affairs, on this government's stewardship of the environment. Under the Liberals, Ontario lost an average of 1,825 hectares of wetlands per year. And the wetlands that do remain have very little, if any, protection. Now, now, nearly half of Southern Ontario's remaining wetlands are at risk of being lost, with no requirements for wetland evaluation before land use changes. To the Premier, what does this government have against wetlands? Seriously, what do they have against them? Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. 
Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the question. You know, the, the other side likes to talk about what could happen, might happen, maybe happen. I'll tell you what will happen. We're going to continue to protect wetlands here in Ontario. We're going to continue to protect those wetlands. We've got a plan, Mr. Speaker. We've got a plan to build 1.5 million homes in this province over the next 10 years and keep a robust ecological footprint. Home builders will still go through a process. Species at risk, there's legislation to cover that. Wetlands are disappearing. We've heard that. We've got an opportunity to not only preserve them, but expand them. And a plan to do that as well. So, Mr. Speaker, don't believe the hype, Mr. Speaker. Wetlands are here to stay in Ontario. Order. Supplementary question. That was pretty amazing. Um, speaker, again to the Premier. Order. The auditor found that along the Niagara escarpment, there is no environmental monitoring because there are no staff. Reports of violations, including high-risk incidents of construction of buildings, have gone unenforced. And nearly all development permit applications have been approved in the past five years, even when they went against the Niagara escarpment plan. Speaker, why isn't the Premier doing anything to protect the Niagara escarpment? Of natural resources and forestry. Well, Mr. Spe uh, Mr. Speaker, thanks again uh, uh, to the member opposite for the question. Uh, the Niagara Escarpment is an arm's length body that uh, does great work, Mr. Speaker, and we know the Niagara Escarpment is a beautiful and wonderful area in Ontario that we want to protect. We've got feedback from the Escarpment folks all the time and talk with them constantly about uh, what can be done to make things better. We'll continue to speak with them, but again, they're their own body. They make their own decisions, and we respect those decisions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the final supplementary. Speaker, how is it in just a few short weeks we've seen this government attack the Greenbelt, yeah. conservation authorities, farmland, wetlands, and do nothing to protect the Niagara Escarpment? And today, the auditor found that the province is missing in action on addressing urban flooding risks. There is no coordinated approach, no effort to protect against the loss of green space, and basically, basically nothing to address aging stormwater infrastructure. All, all while this government strips revenue from municipalities and the effects of climate change are felt more every year. Why isn't this government doing more to protect homeowners from the devastating impact of flooding? Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Thanks again, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the question. You know, flooding is something I've lived personally in my community. Members will recall before I got here that my community suffered two very significant floods, and that's why I was so excited, Mr. Speaker, to see the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry over the years step up their game. Go to Water Street, Mr. Speaker. Go to Water Street and see the facilities that are there to ensure that Ontarians are protected against flooding. It is amazing. They're doing an amazing job. Conservation authorities were we're asking them to focus on flooding and hazard lands to keep people safe. That's the focus and the priority. Build homes, keep people safe, build Ontario. That's what we're going to do. Next question. Member for Nick. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today's Auditor General's report put in writing what we already knew. Ontario vaccines roll out was sloppy and uncoordinated. The government didn't listen to public health experts and let 3.4 million vaccines. Okay, the House will come to order. Start the clock. Member for Nickel Belt has the floor. The government didn't listen to public health experts and let 3.4 million vaccine doses go to waste. Poor planning resulted in nine high-risk neighbourhoods being left out of the province's targeted hotspot strategy, while low-risk neighbourhoods receive early vaccine access. The Premier assembled a vaccine task force, but neglected to include any public health expert on it for weeks. Why did the government not listen to public health experts during the vaccine rollout? The Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, while I have a great deal of respect for the Auditor General on this, I cannot agree with her. The numbers show that we have 
done an incredible job protecting our most vulnerable through a vaccine rollout that is second to only Japan. The member speaks about things that we can look at and point to as successes. Govax buses that were going into communities that had lower vaccine um, uptake. Operation Remote Immunity, where we partnered with Orange Air Ambulance to make sure at the very beginning of the pandemic, when we had limited supplies of vaccines, that they were going in with our partners at Orange to vaccinate remote and fly-in communities. Other Response. opportunities that, frankly, other provinces looked at and wanted to emulate because Ontario was leading in ensuring that our most vulnerable, that our individuals that were at highest risk were getting access to those vaccines as quickly as possible. Supplementary question. Speaker, the auditor found that the ministry's approach to communicating factual information to the public was disorganized, inconsistent, and lacking details about the benefit of COVID vaccine and vaccination. She also found that the ministry missed out on opportunity to educate and inform the public of the benefits of the COVID-19 vaccine, and ultimately, this government undermined public confidence in vaccination. Why did the government undermine public confidence in COVID-19 vaccination. Mr. Pell. Speaker, the numbers don't add up. When you talk about that, you're suggesting that we don't have over 80% of Ontario adults over the age of 12 who are fully vaccinated. We have led the world because we ensured that we had mass vaccination clinics. We had clinics in businesses, in manufacturing facilities. We had GoVax buses going around to higher risk neighbourhoods to make sure that they understood the value and had those conversations. We had Sick Kids Hospital open up a, a phone line to talk to parents and caregivers about their questions that they had when we had vaccines available to children. I will not apologize for our vaccine rollout. We have a lot to be proud of, and the numbers prove that out. <laughs> Next question, the member for Burlington. Speaker, parents in my riding of Burlington want to know that their children are well positioned for success. They want assurances that their children are being taught a modern curriculum by the most qualified educators in schools that are technologically connected and safe. I'm proud that our government is determined to support our children by ensuring they have the necessary learning tools. Everyone wants to see our students succeed in and outside of the classroom. Speaker, can the Minister of Education please provide an update on how our government is taking the right steps to ensure our students have everything they need for a successful and fulfilling education? Minister of education. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Burlington for the wonderful question and her continued focus on young people and their success. Mr. Speaker, under our government, we have undertaken a focus on helping young people graduate and get access to good paying jobs. From a modern curriculum to modern schools to merit based hiring of our educators, Mr. Speaker, we are, we are overhauling our curriculum with a focus on increasing outcomes, graduation rates, results, and better jobs for the young people we represent. It's why, Speaker, we have reformed our curriculum labour market aligned for the first time, including mandatory learning on financial literacy, on coding, on real-life application, on learning, uh, Mr. Speaker, about the importance of balanced budgets, because we know on this side of the House, budgets do not balance themselves, Mr. Speaker. We also know about the concept of debt and inflation, paying taxes. We're teaching kids about problem-solving skills and leadership development. When it comes to modern schools, Bonds. we're investing to build modern schools with over $500 million every year. And, Mr. Speaker, we're ensuring the best educator gets hired in the meritocracy so that the best leader is in front of children in this province. Supplementary question. Speaker, young families in my riding of Burlington are facing economic hardship due to rising inflation and economic uncertainty. 
Childcare has long been a significant expense for working parents who want to ensure that their children receive top quality care while they're at work. Mm -hmm. Speaker, we know that under the previous Liberal government, childcare costs became too expensive and inaccessible for many. This was unacceptable and created a tremendous burden on individuals and families. Speaker, to the Minister of Education, what is our government doing to provide much needed relief for our working families across the province. Mr. Education. So at a time of rising national inflation and the cost of living, our government is stepping up in a big way to deliver financial relief for Ontario families. It's why, Speaker, we signed a better deal with $3 billion more billion and an additional year of investment on the table to ensure every parent for-profit, non-profit parents, which would have been excluded by the Democrats and Liberals, that they have access to the financial relief of roughly $10,000 by the end of this year alone, Speaker. Four times our government has stepped up with direct financial relief to parents. We just rolled out another catch-up payment, which is going to deliver $1.6 billion in total into parents' pockets where we know they need it to face the rising costs. And Mr. Speaker, we're also standing up against the federal Liberal carbon tax, which has raised the cost of home heating, of baby supplies, of food, making clear this aggressive tax hurts the most vulnerable within our communities. Speaker, we are standing up for affordability and will continue under our Premier's leadership to make life Bonds. more affordable and childcare more accessible for Ontario parents. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Over the past few weeks, this government's been dealing with some issues regarding insider information and plans to open up the Greenbelt and the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve, with certain parcels uh, purchased just weeks before the government's announcement. Some of the Premier's most loyal developer friends, the Gasparis family, own 20 properties on the land this government is opening up for development. Just this week, we learned that TAC developments controlled by Silvio de Gasparis and members of his family, borrowed $100 million at an interest rate of 21% annually to purchase Greenbelt land, of all things, in 2021. Speaker, in the minister's experience, is a 21% interest rate on $100 million a good deal? Repairs and housing. You know, uh, Speaker, um, the government's been very clear uh, in our postings. Uh, what our intention is regarding the property. Um, we've been open, clear, and transparent, and look forward to receiving comments from the public. Order. Order. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It turns out the loan was, in fact, a very good deal for the DeGasparis family. In 2020, they bought 475 acres of Greenbelt land for around 24,000 an acre. They own nearly 2,000 acres within the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve. They bought this land cheap because it was protected as farmland in perpetuity. Early estimates find that the soon-to-be newly developable land could be worth at least $380,000 an acre. That's a big payoff for a Greenbelt gamble, Speaker. Did the minister or any other government or PC party official share with any land order or developer or any of their lobbyists or representatives information about the government's plan for removing lands from the Greenbelt before it became public on November 4th? Mr. Mr. Ferris. No. I, I'm going to be assisting the Integrity Commissioner in uh, his investigation. I look forward to be vindicated, uh, and I look forward to the apology from the official opposition. Thank you. Next question, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, like many provinces, Ontario is facing our most significant labour shortage in a generation. This labour shortage greatly impacts our economy and communities, particularly in the skilled trade sector. As our province plans to build for the future, we must ensure that we have enough workers with the right skills to help us meet this challenge. Every skilled trades job that remains unfilled represents unmet economic opportunities for our great province. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. And I ask the minister, what is our government doing to address the ongoing skilled trades labour shortage? 
Minister of Labour, well, Immigration, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke for that very challenging questions here this morning. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government from day one has been on a mission to train more workers so they can build better lives for themselves and fill the jobs that families and businesses across Ontario rely on. Mm -hmm. That is why we are reinventing our programs so that welfare and disability support recipients are no longer left on their own. Instead, the changes we're making are providing tailored solutions like work boots to get them started and a transit pass to get them to their first shift. Mr. Speaker, our message is clear. For anyone looking to find well-paying and meaningful work, our government will give you a hand up. Okay. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his answer as well. Helping people gain the skills employers need means they can support themselves, their families, and our entire province. For far too long, people eager to work, to work hard, and contribute to our economy face difficulties navigating bureaucratic processes, leaving them discouraged. Nothing gives a person a greater sense of pride and worth than the ability to contribute through their work. Our government should act to remove burdens and lift barriers to help people find work opportunities. Speaker, my question again to the minister. How has our government helped more individuals find meaningful employment in this great province? Mr. Labour. Well, thank you, and thanks to the member again for this question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, under the previous government, only 1 per cent of people on social assistance were finding employment each year. That might be good enough for those across the aisle, but it's not good enough for us. In the parts of Ontario where we've started our new approach, the results are outstanding. 79 per cent of job seekers are working at least 20 hours per week, and 55,700 people are now on a path to finding employment. Speaker, this is how we lift people up, and this is how we're going to achieve our ambitious plan to build Ontario. This question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, municipalities are reeling from the alarming passage of Bill 23 on Monday. The lack of consultation, the absence of respect and facts has resulted in a deeply flawed piece of legislation that will undermine housing affordability, increase homelessness and compromise the integrity of the Greenbelt ecosystem. Last week, the member of Kitchener-Conestoga claimed that seven Waterloo Region mun municipalities were, and I quote, sitting on over $200 million of reserve funds from development charges that have already been collected. And specifically, he went on to say that the township of Woolwich was sitting on $6.5 million of D.C. charges that they didn't know about it. In fact, all of the D.C. reserve funds are allocated, and they are in the municipal five-year economic forecast. You just have to learn how to read, I guess. The drastic reduction Order. in development charges will I'm no personal tax in the house. Conclude your question. Well, you just have to meet with the council, and you can see the, the numbers. The drastic reduction in— For Kitchener-Conestoga will now come to order. Member for Waterloo, conclude the question. Will negatively impact uh, the municipality's ability to facilitate housing, which, uh, which is so important in the province of Ontario. Why is the government implying that these funds are not being used and that municipalities are negligent in their duties? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, the member uh, opposite is incorrect. The member for Kitchener-Conestoga is a great member. He meets regularly yeah, yeah. with his municipalities. And, and, and speaker, he was merely quoting the financial information that's provided to the ministry. So if, in fact, the, the, the numbers that municipalities are giving us for the amount of D.C. reserve they have is incorrect, perhaps we should have a deeper dive into the documentation that the ministry is being sent. There were councils in every council chamber, in every corner of the province, that campaigned in advance of the October 24th election that said they wanted to prioritize affordable housing. Yeah. Bill 23 provides the opportunity to be able to discount, to incent having more affordable housing, yeah, yeah. having more attainable housing, having more inclusionary zoning units. It's doing the Response. exact opposite of what the member for Waterloo is suggesting. Yeah. Supplementary question. 
Mr. Speaker, following the shocking uh, comments by the member from Kitchener-Conestoga, I wrote municipalities about the government's assertions. Woolwich Mayor Shant set the record straight, and I quote, based on the pace of our growth, we will actually require additional funding to be able to do all the forecasted work. We are staying with the best practice approach that as much as possible growth should pay for itself. We do not want existing taxpayers to pay that heavy burden that's neither fair or appropriate. Mayor Crombie herself said Mississauga will lose $885 million Order. over 10 years Order. in development charges because of Bill 23. She says it's equal to losing 20 per cent of their capital budget. Why Order. is this government undermining municipalities and their ability to facilitate affordable housing? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, the member for Kitchener-Conestoga is actually standing up for the dream of home ownership. Yeah. We've got young people here. I want to make sure that there's a generation of, of potential homeowners that have a home that meets their needs and their budget. And any mayor like Mayor Crombie, who the member opposite Order. is voting, doesn't think that that $132,000 development charge on a, on a semi-detached home in Mississauga isn't going to get uh, turned over to the, the buyer. She's living in a dream world. Yeah, yeah. Those mayors who speak against our bill have one message. They're saying to that young family, stay in your parents' basement. Yeah. You're never going to have a, a home that meets your needs. We on in the government side, we're going to realize the dream Opposition of the Stand up Commissioner Conestoga will come to order. Member for Waterloo will come to order. Order. Minister of Municipal Affairs will come in order. Question. Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Picture this grim scene 2,300 years ago in Asculum. The Macedonian general Pyrrhus surveys the battlefield. Roman legions, Greek phalanxes, elephants, archers, cavalry lie wounded and dying. A battle so costly, historical accounts disagree on whether any side won. Pyrrhus himself said, if we are victorious in one more battle with the Romans, we shall be utterly ruined. Today, picture this, paramedics lined up at overcrowded emergency rooms, overwhelmed ICU nurses, cancers going undetected, tent communities across Ontario, educators in physical danger because of understaffing, even idled ferries. Why won't the Premier accept the Ontario Superior Court ruling against Bill 124, realize that any appeal would be at most a Pyrrhic victory? Don't start another battle, renegotiate a fair deal and get to work on our real problems. To respond, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As a member opposite knows that we are reviewing the decision that is before us. As the Attorney General said, we have intention to appeal that. But let's compare our record of investments into this province against the 15 years of the previous Liberal government. Let's look at health care. They left this health care system on life support. They cut residency spots. This government is building two new medical schools, one in Brampton. Why would they do that? A new medical school in Brampton, a new medical school in Scarborough, increasing the amount of doctors in the north. That is in stark contrast to the members opposite. We will continue to make these historic investments, supporting health care, uh, health human resources across uh, this province, and we will take no lessons from the members opposite on how to make those health care investments. Thank you. 
Supplementary question. Well, Mr. Speaker, you could either try to learn from history or try to rewrite it like this side does. My question really is, now, what does the Premier hope to gain for the people? He should be sitting down with unions. He should, be, he should stop fighting the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, negotiate a fair deal, and focus on real problems of working families. So my question is, what do the Conservatives hope to gain? from appealing the Ontario Superior Court's ruling against Bill 124. And the President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, as we said, we intend to appeal the, this decision as it is before the courts, but we will stand on our record of investments that we have made that is, again, in stark contrast to the member's office. Let's look at health human resources. Since March of 2020, we have added over 12,000 health care professionals into the system just this wow. year alone. Order. Over 12,800 uh, registered nurses at the Ontario College wow. of Nurses. The member's office oversaw firing uh, of nurses across this Six province. Up. They cut Order. hospital budgets. They closed sure. hospitals. They, sure they, they stopped building hospitals in Brampton in communities like mine that were neglected for 15 years. We're building hospitals in Brampton. Thank you, Minister. We're building hospitals in Windsor, in Niagara, in Mississauga because the previous government failed fail to make those investments. And member for we, Ottawa South, we will Gondor. take no lessons from the members' office on how to make those investments. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atticoke. Thank you, Speaker. All of us in this House share a common goal, keeping Ontario's roads safe for all drivers. In the last year, we have seen an alarming increase in fatal collisions on our roads, particularly in the north. Injuries and fatalities are twice as likely to occur on a northern highway as compared to a highway in southern Ontario. Speaker, this is unacceptable. As the winter season is upon us, drivers in my riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan, and across the north deserve certainty that the government is taking action to put their safety first. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation please tell the House what our government is doing to support transportation safety in northern communities? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, for the great question. Under Premier Ford's leadership, our government is taking concrete steps to make roads in northern Ontario safer. Just a few weeks ago, I was pleased to announce that our government took another step forward to deliver the first ever two plus one highway pilot in North America. Yeah. Speaker, this model is used in jurisdictions around the world, and it's been shown to improve road safety and enhance traffic flow. By issuing the request for proposals for the new pilot on Highway 11, north of North Bay, our government is demonstrating real progress to get shovels in the ground on this critical project, making roads in the north that much safer. A two-plus-one highway pilot is part of our government's plan to build Ontario, and, Speaker, we're getting it done. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answer and for the great work she's doing in her, in her ministry. I want to commend the Minister for her leadership in delivering much-needed safety improvements in the North. Speaker, after 15 years under the previous Liberal government, life became more difficult for people living in Northern Ontario. The previous Liberal government failed on winter road maintenance, cancelled Northern passenger rail service, and neglected to make the meaningful targeted highway investments our region desperately needs. Speaker, can the Minister please elaborate on her newly announced innovative project and how it will support the communities of Northern Ontario? Thank you. Again, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Speaker, we have received resounding support on the 2 plus 1 highway from local stakeholders, including Mark Wilson, from going the extra mile for safety, as well as members of our government's Northern Transportation Task Force. The 2 plus 1 highway pilot will support northern development and boost economic growth in the region after decades of neglect by the previous Liberal governments. And Speaker, this builds on other initiatives cha championed by our government to support and grow the north. Just recently, we created a new highway level of service that requires highways 11 and 17 in northern Ontario to be cleared within 12 hours after a winter storm, four hours faster than the previous standard. But, Speaker, this is not a one-and-done deal for northern drivers. We will continue to look for even more ways to support safer and more Spons. prosperous communities in the north. The next question.
question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. According to the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, the province will need at least 65,000 new childcare staff over the coming years to meet the expected demand for $10 a day childcare. 65,000 childcare staff is an enormous number. To get anywhere close to that will require a long-term strategy to retain and recruit childcare workers. Without a strategy, Parents and families will lose access to $10 a day childcare. My question to the Premier is, where is that strategy? <laughs> reply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, because of our Premier's leadership, we have been able to deliver a better deal with $3 billion on the table more and an additional year of funding guarantees that will ensure childcare remains more affordable and accessible for all Ontario families. Mr. Speaker. And it's fundamental we remind the people of Ontario that had the New Democrats and Liberals had their way, we would have omitted literally 30 per cent of operators in all of our communities that are depending on government to create, come up with a sustainable, inclusive program to reduce costs. On average, by Christmas of this year, we're looking at $12,000 per child. This is a monumental step forward, and the member opposite is right. We will need more ECs to fulfill the 86,000 spaces this government is working to create. It's why we have a plan, Speaker. We've launched a specific advisory group that has been established over the, over the fall of non-profit, for-profit and technical experts coming together to ensure we've got the requisite staff, we continue to increase wages, and we continue to roll out a program Response. that has 92 per cent of operators enrolling because they believe in this program and the people of Ontario are depending on this government to get the job done. Supplementary question. Speaker. Any advisory group on the workforce has to include the voices of workers. And I want to remind the minister that in section 4.2 of the child care agreement that he refers to, Ontario committed to consulting on a comprehensive recruitment and retention plan for child care workers this past summer. I've tabled a bill to start addressing the child care workforce crisis by ensuring that solutions put forward by workers and advocates are listened to. My question to you, Minister, will you listen to child care workers? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. What I can confirm is that the uh, Work Face Stabilization Advisory Group is going to be launched this fall with the aim this winter, with the aim of including the voices of all those working the expert working in our child care space, because we want to rely on their expert experiences, ensuring that we have the right staff who are trained and supported with the right levels of salary so that we can retain and recruit these high-quality workers. Mr. Speaker, we're going to hire thousands of additional ECs in our province because we will need more people to staff the 86,000 more spaces this government will create, more access in addition to more affordable child care. It rose by 400 per cent under the former Liberal government, an indefensible record. And this government and our Premier knows we can make child care affordable for families for future generations, and we're going to get the job done. Well the next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Great, Minister. I recently uh, learned of a, a wonderful grant to a local theatre community, a theatre group called the Tweed and Company Theatre a fine organization that has benefited from the support provided by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. The support they received likely won't make headlines in the news, but that funding will have an immense impact on ensuring the sustainability and the expansion of this fine organization's productions. I'm always impressed by how much can be accomplished when nonprofit organizations receive the funding that they greatly deserve. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport Please tell us more about the resources available so that other community organizations across the province can realize the same benefit. Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Mr. Th uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. And I'd just like to add on that uh, we don't look for headlines, we look for results, right? Here, here. Okay. Here, here. I'd like to thank the member for his question and for the strong leadership representing the residents of Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. He will be interested to know that our government agency, created 40 years ago under the great leadership of the PC Premier Bill Davis, continues to build healthy and vibrant communities 
across Ontario. Since the voters of Ontario entrusted Premier Ford to lead the PC government in 2018, $2.4 million has been invested through the Ontario Trillium Foundation in non-profit sector in ha Hastings, Lennox, and Addict. Will later, Speaker, because I'm running out of time, but I'll go back to the point that we get results. We're not worried about what people talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you as a minister for that response. $2.4 million for my riding is, is, is absolutely wonderful. In my previous role as a municipal mayor, I was fortunate to witness the many impressive achievements made possible through support but from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. Whether it's replacing benches and bleachers in three of our sports facilities in Tweed, support for the Royal Canadian Legion in Bancroft, or providing assistance to the heart of Hastings Hospice. All these programs have greatly benefited. Mr. Speaker, once again, can the Minister of Tourism and Cult Culture and Sport please provide additional information, additional details on how the Ontario Trillium Foundation can help nonprofit organizations across the province? Mr. Tourism. Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to do so. Um, I join the representatives from all parties in this House for a breakfast celebrating Ontario Trillium Foundation's 40th anniversary just over a week ago. Recognition of OTF's value is universal, and I'm happy to promote the Foundation whenever possible, because it's important to all of us. The OTF's Resilient Communities Fund is making positive contributions in communities across Ontario, working towards economic recovery with grants of up to $150,000 to help nonprofits rebuild and recover from the impacts of COVID-19. In fact, the deadline's coming up. It's time to get it done. That deadline is December 7th. 2022, so I encourage organizations to do that, get it done. Our government invests $105 million through Community Building Fund to support non-profit tourism, culture, sport and recreation organizations that create great experiences and great events across Response. this province. I'll continue to work with the OTF and help them do what they do best, help us and our province. Next question. Member for Commissioning Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture. Ontario loses 319 of acres of farmland every day to development, 319 acres that will never ever grow food again. And now the government's trying to pave over the green belt as well. And farmers are concerned because the three farm organizations that represent almost every farmer in this province have written an open letter to the Premier expressing that fact, and I'd like to quote from that letter, and I quote, these losses are not sustainable and will become increasingly worse with the overreaching effects of Bill 23, more, ho more homes built faster, 2022. My question to the minister is, does she agree with the farmers of Ontario that farmland loss at this rate is unsustainable. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise in this house to, to address the amazing industry that we have in Ontario, our agri-food sector. And you know, just on Monday, we released a Grow Ontario plan that has been well received by every commodity organization and every general farm organization in this province. And part of that strategy over the next 10 years is to see production increase by 30 per cent. Farmers and agri-food businesses alike are applauding the fact that we have a strategy that's going to see our agri-food sector not only excel, but year over year increase yield as we embrace new innovations and new technologies that are going to see our yields go through the roof. Because why? Ontario consumers need confidence in their food supply, not only in this province, but across Canada. And the rest of the world is Response. watching our industry because they're seeing us as leaders. So again, Speaker, our future is bright in Ontario's agri-food industry. Thank you very much. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer. But you have the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, the Christian Farmers Federation of Ontario, and the National Farmers Union. Those farmers telling you that yields are great, but yields are per acre. And when you lose 320 acres a day over the long term, you're losing the ability to produce food. They are ringing the warning bells. 
to your government. Order. They've written to the Premier with that warning. My question is, and I have asked this question several times, and yet to hear the minister say the word farmland. Does she actually represent farmers at the cabinet table to say the word Order. farmland? Thank you. Order. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, that assertion is absolutely bananas coming from that critic. Absolutely bananas. And look in hands to see what that acronym stands for, because the fact of the matter is we have released a strategy that has been embraced by every single player and, and stakeholder in our value chain. We're looking to strengthen our agri-food supply chain over the next 10 years. We're increasing production by 30 per cent. We're increasing food manufacturing by 30 per cent. We're increasing our exports by 8 per cent annually. And most importantly, we're looking to increase our food and beverage manufacturing by 10 per cent. Again, Speaker, the future is bright because we have a government that not only understands but cares for the agri-food industry in this province. And by working through our three pillars, again, to strengthen our supply chain, to embrace innovation and agri-tech, as well as growing our labour force, our workforce and the talent within our agri-food sector, we are going Response. to excel and the world is going to see us as a world leader. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. Ensuring police services in Ontario have the resources they need to keep the communities in Simcoe Gray and across our province safe is of the utmost importance. Mm. Having up-to-date technology means that our officers will have the best information available to carry out their work effectively. Recently, the Solicitor General spoke about our government's investment of $61 million in new wow. technology to fight auto theft across this province. Investing in new crime-fighting technology is crucial to helping our police services solve outstanding cases and bring closure to the victims and their families. Absolutely. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please tell us how investments our government is making in the new technology will assist our law enforcement partners in delivering justice to our residents? Great question. Great question. Great question. The Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my friend from Simcoe Gray for the question. And in Ontario, we are investing in the latest technology and using cutting edge techniques to keep Ontario safe. And we are a province of innovation and progress, and we're proud of this. Just last week, the Ontario Provincial Police, with the help of the state of the art genetic based technology, were able to close a 1980 murder case of Michelin Saint Amour. And this science is transformational. And I want to recognize retired Detective Superintendent Dave Tro and retired Detective Constable Mike Hickey for their work in solving this homicide. And now Micheline's family can finally have some peace. Monsieur le Président, rien pour... Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, as a Solicitor General, I think the safety of our province is of utmost importance, and uh, uh, the Premier of Ontario is uh, doing the best he, he can for the province. Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for that uh, answer. It is reassuring to hear that this new revolutionary new technology was instrumental in delivering justice for the victim and helping to bring peace to their family after all these years. As reported by the media, because of our government's investments, police services across our province will be able to advance unsolved cases for DNA technology investigation in the coming years. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please provide more details on how Ontario's police services can use investigative genetic genealogy as an investigative tool? Wow. The Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, on Monday of this week, the Toronto Police Service arrested a suspect in Moussigny in the murders of two women that happened back in 1983. Now, after four decades of work, the families of the victims can have some closure. My ministry is proud to have provided a grant used to fund genetic genealogy for the Toronto Police Service. Science, technology and innovation helps police in their pursuit of justice for everyone and to keep our communities safe. They will never give up. And we want to thank Detective Sergeant Steve Smith and his whole team from Toronto's Homicide and Missing Persons Cold Case Unit. 
We will continue to invest in leading-edge technology so that our police have the tools and resources they need to fight crime. Monsieur le Président, nous continuerons de faire ce que Mr. Speaker, we want to continue to do whatever is needed in order to guarantee safety for Ontario. Question number for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, London Health Sciences Centre has an innovative plan to redirect patients suffering from mental health episodes to a new emergency room. But Ontario refuses to help or provide funding unless the already cash-strapped City of London ponies up $300 million of the total cost. $300 million. My question to the Premier. Why are you forcing the City of London to pay when health care funding is a provincial responsibility? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, from the very beginning, our Premier had a focus on mental health and addictions, which is why, of course, we have our first Minister of Mental Health and Addictions here in the province of Ontario. We understand that there are partnerships that exist within communities that need to be fosters, fostered, and part of those commitments are ensuring that the responsibilities of the municipality, of the health care system uh, federally, uh, are working together to make sure all of these innovative proposals are appropriately funded. I would love to look in more detail at the uh, program or, or uh, idea that the member opposite is interested in sharing and uh, happy to follow up with him late after question period. My question is back to the Premier, because how can this government talk about commitments and working together when they refuse to meet with frontline workers to discuss solutions to our health care crisis? Cities lose revenue with Bill 23, cities lose democracy with Bill 39, and now Premier Ford, who's sitting on billions, wants to download responsibilities onto municipalities and taxpayers to fund provincial health care. Yep. My question, why is this government downloading huge costs onto municipalities like London when they're underfunding health care by almost $900 million? Minister of Health. Well, with the greatest of respect, where was the member in August when we voted on a budget that increased health care over $5 billion? You voted against it. You opposed those investments that we are making in health care, we are making with hospitals, in uh, mental health and addictions organizations that are doing incredible work across Ontario. We've made the investments. We've increased the number of beds that are available in communities uh, to make sure that people are getting the, uh, the services they need. The member opposite needs to look himself in the mirror and say, why didn't he support that $5 billion added increase in August? The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. Ottawa is home to over a million Ontarians and is among Canada's largest cities. Significant population growth is projected over the next decade for the Ottawa area, including in my riding of Carleton. Ottawa and the surrounding areas are favourable destinations for newcomers to settle. And with new immigration targets set by the federal government, there is a real concern, Mr. Speaker, regarding housing availability needs to meet both current and future demands. As many newcomers will, will arrive in Ottawa and the surrounding areas, housing availability will remain a pressing concern. Speaker, through you, can the Associate Minister of Housing please explain what our government is doing to provide housing relief for new and existing Ontarians living in the Ottawa area? Thank you. Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank my honourable colleague from Carleton for the question and also for her strong advocacy, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to housing on behalf of her constituents, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, I was in the member's local city last week alongside my federal and municipal counterparts to announce a $90 million housing announcement across the City of Ottawa to support the construction of more than 270 units. Speaker, 
These units will meet a variety of accessibility and affordability needs, ranging from studio to three-bedroom apartments. And I look forward to continuing our partnership with all levels of government, as well as the nonprofit and private sector, to ensure that all Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, including the most vulnerable in our communities, have a safe place to call home. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister of Housing for his answer. Uh, Fantastic minister and the people of Aurora, Oak Ridge, and Richmond Hill are blessed to have a hardworking, hardworking member like, uh, like the minister. And you know, it's really reassuring, Mr. Speaker, that our government is implementing strategies addressing housing availability in Ontario, including in communities in my riding of Carleton, like Finley Creek, Riverside South, Sitzville, Greeley, and more. And by working with all levels of government, housing supply will expand to address the needs of the current population and newcomers settling in the Ottawa area. So through you, Mr. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Housing please expand on our government's plan to address housing projects that will benefit local communities in Ottawa? Thank you. Associate Minister. Absolutely can, Speaker. And again, I want to thank my uh, colleague from Carleton for the follow-up question. And Speaker, to add to my previous answer, the funding will support five projects across the city of Ottawa, including the project that our government is supporting, which is located at 159 Forward Avenue. Mr. Speaker, this will be a four-story building with a total of 49 units. 30 of which will be designated as affordable, and the remaining 19 will have rents that are on par or below average market rent, Mr. Speaker. As, as, I, well, as I've said from day one, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to do everything we can to support projects like this one because they prioritize and support the most vulnerable. And with lack of supply and housing prices out of control for many Ontarians, Speaker, we'll continue to work again with all partners, all levels of government, to increase supply and support housing in every corner of our here, province. Here. Thank you very much, Speaker. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. I was contacted by a constituent, Elliot. Elliot's doctor has announced new fees for previously insured OHIP services. Elliot is now being asked to pay for basic services like getting prescriptions, referrals and transferring medical records. Forcing people to pay for basic services like getting a prescription refill is not just a hurdle, it's a threat to people's health and well-being. Why are patients like Elliot being charged these surreptitious fees? Mr. Health. So, as with many questions that come from the NDP caucus, uh, there needs to be more detail to that um, question. Uh, the, I would begin with what are we talking about in terms of are they phone appointments, phone uh, consultations, because there is a change that is coming up as of December 1st to ensure that more family physicians have the ability to meet in direct uh, with, with their patients directly, as opposed to temporary codes that were put in place during the height of the pandemic to make sure that individuals had access to their primary care physicians. We put those virtual care codes in place because we wanted to make sure that individuals had the opportunity to continue relationships with their primary care uh, physicians. There is a change that has been approved by the Ontario Medical Association, voted on from their members that will ensure a, a, a switch to, while virtual care continues in the province Response. of Ontario, it will be funded at a different level than in-person care. Thank you. Supplementary. And my question is back to the Minister of Health. Elliot's doctor won't perform these services without a $20 e-transfer or a yearly subscription fee of $125. Accessing public health care shouldn't require e-transfers or credit cards. Those unable to pay could start avoiding their family doctor and wind up in emergency rooms. What is your plan to ensure Ontarians can get the health care they deserve using only their OHIP card? That's not their plan. Our plan is our plan to stay open. Our plan is to build two new medical schools in the province of Ontario, in Brampton, in Scarborough. The first new medical schools, frankly, that have happened since, wait for it, a previous Conservative government. Oh, wow. so our plan 
has been to work with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario to ensure that as internationally educated graduates, uh, medical practitioners have the opportunity to get their uh, Education Order. reviewed, assessed, and ultimately approved if they qualify. We are making the changes to make sure that individuals who want to practice medicine in the province of Ontario can continue to do so. I will never suggest that what the member opposite is, is saying is appropriate, but I will also say our family physicians have stepped up consistently Response. to assist in the vaccine rollout and protecting the people of Ontario. Question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, for too long, the previous Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, failed to make the investments that were needed in broadband infrastructure. In so many communities, such as in my riding of Niagara West and in rural uh, communities across Ontario, the failure to make these investments meant that our people were not able to be connected to the jobs of today and tomorrow. Speaker, broadband access isn't just uh, a requirement for participating in our economy. It's also a requirement for people to ensure that they're able to access uh, important social community uh, ties, as well as speaking with their family members. Speaker, our government has made historic investments in this crucial infrastructure area, and I'm wondering if the, member, if the Minister of Infrastructure would be able to explain to the House and to the people of my community what investments are being made to ensure that rural communities across Ontario are being connected today and tomorrow. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much to the member for the question. As everyone knows, we are investing $159 billion over 10 years to build critical infrastructure across this province. Four billion of those uh, of that funds will be allocated to make sure that everybody in the province of Ontario, including our rural communities, will be connected. Mr. Speaker, we completed our reverse auction this summer. Um, Eight internet service providers have been selected to connect 266,000 homes, Mr. Speaker. We have 40 to 60,000 more premises to connect. We are currently working on our last, small, last mile strategy to make sure that everyone in Ontario has quick and easy and reliable access to high speed internet here. across the province. Here, here, here. Supplementary. Thank you. My thanks to the Minister of Infrastructure for her response to my question and for the investments that her ministry, as well as so many others, are making in rural Ontario. For too long, the previous Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, ignored the needs of rural communities. Under the leadership of Premier Ford and this Ontario PC team, that is changing. The minister spoke about some of the investments that are being made in communities such as mine. And when I think of places like Kimbo, Winger, uh, Grassy, St. Anne's, small communities where historic investments are having a real impact in the lives of so many of my uh, constituents. I know that it's important this work continues. Can the minister speak more about the important plan to ensure that each and every household in the province of Ontario is connected to modern high-speed internet? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think it's really important for us to recognize that prior to COVID, there were 700,000 premises that did not have access to high-speed internet. How could a family quite possibly earn an income working from home or educate their child or reach their doctor at home without access? Mr. Speaker, we have 40 to 60,000 premises to go. We will not stop until every single one is connected. That concludes our question period for this morning. Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a point of order. Uh, most people know today to be St. Andrew's Day. I would also like to recognize that today is Scottish Heritage Day in Ontario. I'm proudly wearing my McDonnell tie of Glengarry, as it is the regimental tartan of the SCNG Highlanders in my riding. It is also the family tartan of my pre predecessor, Jim McDonnell, whose private member's bill last year proclaims November 30th in each year as Scottish Heritage Day in Ontario, just one part of Jim's legacy as an MPP in this House. Jim, the good Scott, Barbara Stevenson, is stopping by with some Starbucks. <laughs> before, before I recess the House, I want to inform the House that we have a special guest in the West Visitors Gallery, former member of the National Assembly who served the riding of Nelligan for four terms, Russell Williams. It's great to have you here.
There being no further business, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.